So again, I'm Amy Illa from DCD Planning. I am the project manager. This is for this project, the Envision South 13th Street Together plan. This is the third meeting of um, four that we're talking about different topics um, that have or come out of basically some survey results in terms of what's important to the community in this area. Um, these four meetings will not be the end of our discussion, but it's the beginning of kind of a data gathering and listening to the community. Um, so there'll be another meeting on Monday, November 9th, where we'll talk about the corridor's identity. So please come back and join us then. That's in two weeks. Um, and then we had two other meetings on the Envision 13th Street website. You can find videos um, and provide any feedback. Um, so the presentations are there and we're working on collecting all of the notes from all the discussion and posting those as well. So um, today I'll go over kind of a really brief overview of the project. If you've been with us before, this will look familiar, so I'll keep it brief. Um, and then we will hear from Stephanie to talk about what we've heard from the survey results. And then we'll hear from representatives from um, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, Milwaukee County, Milwaukee Rec, Sablocki Elementary School, and the Forest Home Cemetery. And then we'll move into a discussion where it's kind of a virtual board with maps and digital sticky notes um, where two of my colleagues will um, recording, be recording all the comments that you provide. All right. So um, this might look familiar to some of you again, um, but the city is divided into 14 different comprehensive area plans. These guide future development with land use design and catalytic project recommendations. The area that we're talking about for Envision South 13th Street together is mostly within the southwest side area plan, um, but the northern portion also falls within the near south side plan. And then also within this area is the Kinnikinick River Corridor Neighborhood Plan, um, which was a combined effort from um, 16th Street Community Health Centers and MMSD in 2009. So all of these plans help inform um, the Envision South 13th Street Together plan as well. So um, this is a strategic action plan, which means we're gonna get into details in terms of specific projects. Um, we'd like to work with the community to help us prioritize those projects, identify timelines, um, identify responsible parties, and then define next steps. The reason this is all coming together is because the bid and the community brought forward this need um, for an action plan that really looks at how to reinvigorate South 13th Street um, and connects then all the amenities there and the amenities within the neighborhoods to the corridor. So the project um, began kind of at a community level in the spring with a survey um, through 16th Street Community Health Centers and some community partners. And then we had an official launch in August and then moving into these community meetings. Um, again, this is the first set of community meetings and then we'll be having a few more um, to get into more of the details with recommendations for the plan um, and working with community to draft the plan and moving towards um, a draft plan and adoption in the spring of 2021. And now I'll hand it over to Stephanie. Thanks. Great, thanks Amy. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stephanie Mercado and I'm working with 16th Street Community Health Centers, uh, again with the Department of Environmental Health. So this segment is focused on what have we heard thus far? Um, as many of you know, we do have a survey circulating and we've been circulating it through the pandemic. So we've gone around uh, over a little, little over 200 responses thus far. And th th these results that you're seeing now are questions focused on green spaces in the neighborhood, specifically parks and um, places to recreate, which is gonna be a lot of our discussion tonight. So when we're looking at, when we asked, how would you rate the following characteristics of South 13th Street between West Harrison Avenue and Morgan Avenue? Uh, we saw that in general, respondents felt poorly about the amount of parkland in the neighborhood. You see 41% felt poorly about the places to exercise and then 42.9% felt um, that there wasn't a, that great of an amount of, of parkland, at least that they were familiar with. Next slide. And how would you rate uh, the like the characteristic of places to exercise of South 13th Street, people again felt poorly around 41%. So 
we know that parks and trails can be a great options for places that exercise and recreate. However, next slide. Um, we saw that 54% of respondents don't know of any trails in the neighborhood or near the neighborhood. One third of respondents don't know of any places to recreate near or along South 13th Street. And nearly half of respondents infrequently visit their neighborhood green spaces. So this meeting is great, is a, is a response to this need and um, request for more information because often you don't, we, we just don't know what we don't know. Today we'll be talking a lot about what parks and green spaces do exist in the neighborhood and how we can work together to activate those spaces. Some things we've heard, however, are that the people that do know about these green spaces and parks really seem to like them. So we see people are happy with the Ohio playground updates. Um, they think that parks play into the neighborhood's identity. Um, we see that people love the improvements in Pulaski Park and the ongoing renaturalization of the KK River. And then lastly, we have a comment about, uh, well, we had a few comments about ways to, to increase participation or programming in parks, including like creative ideas like farmers markets or different block parties and neighborhood activities. And then I will pass it on to Patrick. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so my name is Patrick Elliott, and I am a project manager working on the Kinnickinnick River projects, uh, the flood management and the concrete removal project. Next slide. And so all of this work is taking place in the Kinnickinnick River watershed. And, and uh, just give you a little background. Uh, uh, watershed, you can see it as a funnel. And so all of the drops of rain or snow, any, any drop of water that falls within this boundary that includes the airport and Wilson Park and Jackson Park, all of that falls within this area and flows down into this neighborhood uh, between 6th to 16th Street and eventually out to Lake Michigan. And the problem with the Kinnickinnick River watershed is that it's a very urbanized funnel um, and you have a lot of hard surfaces that push a lot of water. So a lot of these, the rain hits these surfaces, it moves quickly out and uh, overwhelms the stream areas, the stream corridors and spills out into the neighborhood. Next slide. And so we have over 660 structures that are now located in the high flood risk uh, floodplain or the 100 year floodplain. Uh, next slide. And the way they addressed this back in the day was they lined these streams with concrete. And so we have over seven miles of stream that are lined with concrete. Uh, we have another three miles or so that were placed underground in, in closed culverts. And the goal of this concrete was to move water as fast as possible uh, through these areas. And the big problem was this is that it is very dangerous. It's very slippery and the water moves so quickly uh, that we've had a number of drownings over the years because people once they if they fall in, they're just not getting out. Uh, and then it's also it's falling apart and needs to be taken care of. Next slide. So we have a plan that's on a watershed level that is to not only address and remove all of this concrete and restore it back to a natural uh, river design, uh, but it's also to address the flood, uh, the flood risk, to reduce the flood risk. And we'll just focus on the Knicknick River, next slide, which is right up in the top there. And we'll focus in on this next slide in that area. And that stretches from 6th Street on the right side of your slide. Uh, so around 6th in Cleveland. And this extends all the way up into the Jackson Park neighborhood. And you can see that's the flood risk that was shown there. That's over 300 homes uh, that are located in the high flood risk zone. And a lot of them are located in that area between 6th to 16th. Next slide now. And we have a, a number of different projects that are to remove the concrete channel lining. This uh, over three miles of concrete just on the Connecticut River alone and to address that flood risk. Uh, but we have to address this, we have to construct these projects in a certain order so that we're not increasing flood risk. Uh, so 
uh, that section right at the right, the 6th to 16th Street project, that is the bottom of the funnel. And the recommendation that we have within that area is that we want to make that area wider. Uh, we want to open up that bottom of the funnel, and we can't do that until we hold back some of the water in the Jackson Park area. The, the reason why is if we open up the bottom of the funnel and just will let all that water flow out, uh, it will actually make flood conditions worse for people downstream. So we're doing this in a certain order so that we're always lowering the flood risk as we construct these projects. So next slide. So the project that we have identified that, that uh, did not increase flood risk in, in this interim is the Pulaski Park project. And I think that most of you are probably aware of this work. Next slide. So this is uh, work on the left side of the slide shows the uh, old park and the old channel lining that ran from the railroad tracks on the bottom of the slide round uh, around the pool area and then up past Cleveland and around the pavilion and then to 16th Street. Uh, the other side is the design rendering where we were uh, going to be removing that concrete, restoring it to a naturalized channel and then replacing and repairing the uh, park assets as we do this project. Next slide. So again, I, I imagine that most of you are aware of the improvements that are taking place in Pulaski Park. If these photos right here look strange to you, uh, if you're not sure where that is, then you may have to walk over and take a look at Pulaski Park uh, because it's undergone a, a, a big change and uh, we think a, a pretty great one. And, and you know the important thing with this is that we got so much neighborhood feedback into this project uh, ahead of this project and during it that really helped us make the park is uh, what it is today. And that's the type of work that we want to replicate going forward is not just to make this uh, in our own little bubble, but to reach out and work with the community and get as much participation and. and uh, as much feedback in order to make this park great and these projects great. So the next steps that we have along the, the Kniknik River, uh, we are working up in the Jackson Park area right now. We are working with Milwaukee County Parks on that project and developing a preliminary design and, and we will have some outreach sessions there with, with that community and, and likely include several of you folks as well. Um, and at the same time, uh, we are working on moving forward with the, the project in the 6th to 16th area, uh, that project on the right side. So uh, next year, you will see some sewer projects that are moving forward. Uh, that is uh, some large sewer projects that will take place down around 8th Street. And then the city will also have some work on the south side of the channel, moving sewers out of the way. and then. Next slide, kind of go through this a little bit here. This is the river channel. And again, we need uh, flood, we need additional conveyance, next slide, to move the, we need additional space to move the water through this area. And so next slide, we have to acquire these homes that are along this section. So we, as many of you are probably aware, we've acquired a number of different homes along this section of the channel. Uh, we have 79 that have acquired out of the 83. And so we have to acquire and remove the last remaining four. And so that will also take place over the next couple of years. And then starting next year, we will move into the final design. Next slide. And that will work towards uh, getting feedback and finishing up the final design so we can uh, help define what this natural corridor looks like through this section, this naturalized uh, expanded channel, as well as all the several different bridges that we're gonna be replacing as part of this project. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica uh, with Milwaukee County Parks. Hi everybody, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, and I wanna say thank you to everyone who took that survey and is giving us this important trail data. Um, I work for Milwaukee County Parks, I'm the trails coordinator, um, and we know we have some real gaps in our system, but it really helps us when we have the community clearly saying that. Um, it's really great material for when we try to go get funding to help build our trails. Um, so 
for people who maybe those half of people who didn't know about trails, they're, maybe they're on this call, maybe they're not. Um, I do want to let people know that we have two main trails. We have the Oak Leaf Trail, Connect Connect Line, um, and that's maintained by the county and goes through county parks along the river. And then there's also the city of Milwaukee owned and maintained um, Connect Connect River Trail. So they have ever so slightly different na names. One's the Connect Connect Line of the Oak Leaf and one is the Connect Connect River Trail. Um, but they both have the same concept that we know people love trails that follow rivers so they can get close to water. The rivers provide a good corridor for um, people to walk and bike and enjoy nature. Uh, so we, the county and the city are partnering together to continue to improve the trail network. Um, from the county perspective, our main goal moving forward is to work to have more of the on parkway seg segments of the Oak Leaf Trail, the KK line moved to an off street segment. So um, I just wanna explain that a little bit to make sure that's clear to everybody. Um, so we, we call the Connect Connect Parkway part of the Oak Leaf Trail, but I know to many people, the KK Parkway just feels like a street. Um, and so recognizing that we wanna build an actual separate trail um, along the river in as many places as we can. And we hope to partner with MMSD as they're doing um, flood abatement that we can also add a trail. Um, we love the work that they did in Pulaski Park and we got a really great segment of Oak Leaf Trail there. And that connects, we hope fully to the east, to the city KK River Trail. Um, and it goes, if you go to the west, you can go to the Connect Connect Sports Center, the trails off street there. Um, and then in this map, you can see that the kind of darker brown um, is where the trail is currently on street and the more orange is where it's currently off street. And, you know, it's probably a 30 year goal, um, but we hope to get all of the KK Parkway um, off, have the trail be off street in its own protected area like most people expect trails to be. Um, another thing that the city and county are working on together is a coordinated walk and bike signage plan. Um, so the, the city and the county jointly went after a grant to develop a new concept for signing because we do know that so many people don't know that a trail might be in their neighborhood or really where it goes. So we have new standards for wayfinding um, that really show you different destinations and how to get there. We'll be implementing a pilot of this in Pulaski Park, hopefully yet this year, as long as it doesn't freeze too soon. Um, but we, I encourage people to kind of be on the lookout in the next few years as both the city and the county put this whole family of signs um, up in different neighborhoods to really one, show how to stay on trails and two, how to, sh to show how to get to trails and how to use the bike network, even on city streets. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pam from Milwaukee Rec. Hi, I am Pam Lynn. I'm with Milwaukee Recreation. I'm our facilities project manager. Um, MKE Rec is a part of MPS. We operate and maintain 52 play fields in the city of Milwaukee. And in 2014, we set up a master plan. A lot of our play fields were in need of a, a pretty serious update. And we realized that many were, so we kind of developed this equity plan. So it said about prioritizing um, the play fields and how we would update them. And as you can see from the map here in the middle, um, Madrajewski, I'll just call it Mojo for short, is num ranked number one in our equity plan. It wasn't in our first kind of cohort of parks that we updated, and that was um, due to the MMSD project that we really wanted to work together. Um, MMSD and 16th Street Community um, Health Partners really helped us or initiated the community engagement for um, the play field as part of the KK River Project. So we'll get that to that in a moment. And then the other two play fields are Ohio play field and Holt play field. And then we also have Southgate just to the west. Next slide. So you can see we have um, the, the three play fields, Holt. Mojo and Ohio, they're your um, typical neighborhood park. They're all about a block in size. 
Um, Holt is about 2.7 acres and Mojo and Ohio are about 3.5 acres. Next. Recently, we just completed, as I think was previously mentioned, the new Totlet at Ohio Playfield. We had, we had done some community engagement to help us master plan the playfield. Um, and part of that master planning phase two will be a little further down the road, but we needed to um, have the master plan to know where to locate the playground. So again, that just opened about a month ago. Next slide. And this is the master plan um, for um, Madrajewski, and I, pardon me if I'm saying that wrong. Um, and again, the master plan, this was developed in July of 2018 and had um, robust community engagement that was led by MMSD, um, 16th Street Community Health Partners, and Grace, our consultant, and that was from 2016 to 2017. In 2018, we received a grant um, from the Federal Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program, and that was for 750,000, and right now we have a pending state stewardship grant for this project. And Again, as I said earlier, this was number one on our priority list. Um, the grants, COVID is slightly slowed, um, the awarding of the grants. So we're, we had hoped to be in design at this point, but we're going out for an RFP. So we're um, in process of selecting a design team to take this from this um, concept stage into construction plans and looking to start construction in 2022. Again, and that would be in conjunction and we'll be working with MSD on the KK River project and coordinating that effort. Go to the next slide. And this is Southgate Playfield, so just a little west of the South 13th Street area. And this was in our first round of Playfields. As you can see, the slide on the left here is what Southgate looked like before. So within the fence line, it was 99% asphalt. It might be 100%. And then after, it shows the new basketball and splash pad and playground and nice big green lawn and walking trail and painted play. And so this will be a similar scale of upgrade to what we'll see at Mojo Playfield. And with that, I will turn it over to Principal Coleman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Greg Coleman, Principal, Proud Principal, Zablocki Community School. Um, and uh, myself, I have Ms. Ludis. Uh, also, she is the Community School Coordinator who will be um, uh, jumping in to talk about our new green space. So uh, last year um, in October, we were um, awarded uh, participation in cohort four with uh, MMSD in conjunction with Reflow um, for the green schoolyard redevelopment. Um, our playground um, was is about 99% asphalt also. And so we have come up with some conceptual drawings in conjunction with our uh, students, um, our green team at Zablocki, the our parents, the family leadership organization, as well as our staff. And we have come up with these renderings. Uh, uh, well, Reflow has come up with these renderings to show what our green space will look like um, uh, in the year 2022, I believe uh, we're set to be finished. Uh, next year, or right now, we're in the um, fundraising phase of our playground redevelopment. We are just also completing the conceptual phase, as you can see, where we had uh, input from all of those stakeholders that I mentioned before. Um, if you take a look, it is a, uh, at the top left corner, is a um, bird's eye view of what our playground will look like, uh, or I shouldn't say our playground, our campus will look like because we're also going to be adding some things to the front of the uh, school building also. Um, and then down to the bottom left, 
uh, you can see that we'll have an outdoor classroom that will also be for the community. It is a stage, so uh, various um, artists and uh, community members can come and uh, take advantage of the stage. There will be uh, tree stumps that will be um, surrounding that also. That will be like seats for the children or seats for community members when they come uh, to watch a show. Uh, we will have raised garden beds for garden community, uh, excuse me, community gardening. Um, and then if you take a look at the top right uh, picture, we have um, what our playground will look like. So the parking lot will stay, but we will uh, freshen up the asphalt. Uh, it will be bordered by um, some uh, um, green green plants and uh, native plants that are native here mm -hmm. to Wisconsin. Uh, we have a soccer field uh, going in. We would like to see that being uh, the artificial turf. Uh, and then our basketball court is going to get a makeover also. Uh, we will have a, uh, a, a Zen garden for students to go and decompress and relax. There will be like plants like lavender there uh, that will uh, inspire relaxation. Uh, and you can see that down at the bottom right uh, corner. Uh, if you look at the blue like squiggly line that is running through, that is actually a picture of the KK River. Uh, so that will be um, implemented on our playground also. Uh, to tell you uh, about a little bit more about how the community will use it, I'll turn it over to Ms. Ludis, and then she can speak to some of the uh, community involvement. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ms. Ludis, the community school coordinator um, working at Sablaki. So I want to say um, this, the need to apply for this um, conceptual plan was multi, um, there are several reasons. The one is that um, I had conversations with residents in the area um, and in community school lingo, we call those community conversations. And many of the residents expressed a, um, a desire to have more green space or a place where uh, they can take their children, a place where um, they can hang out. Uh, and then some of these ideas uh, are, as Mr. Coleman mentioned, uh, were came about um, from input from different stakeholders. Um, then, uh, the other reason was that we needed this this space is because we had a lot of like uh, accumulation of water right in the area where the children line up to go into the building or used to go into the school yard for recess and in the winter time it just turned into a sheet of ice so the kids were it was very dangerous it wasn't safe for anyone so we were very excited to um, have this conceptual plan and very excited for the fundraising space and even more so for the implementation of the actual renderings and um, so in terms of this, this space being available to the community as a community school, one of the things that we do is we want to involve the community in every, you know, in every aspect of the things that we do. So it's going to be a space that's available for families, not just for Sablaki families and students, but anyone in the community can come and, you know, make use of the garden beds. Um, use of the Zen garden, which by the way, was the idea of one of my green team students, which is a third grader. She came up with that part of, of um, uh, that idea for this park, uh, this for the schoolyard and the use of lavender as uh, something to help calm students who are having a stressful day. So um, so this, this is gonna be another green space that would just add so much more to our community and it's open for use of the, the outdoor classroom is and is also a great space for um, neighborhood events, um, neighborhood, um, what do you call those, uh, like barbecues or not barbecues, but like gatherings. Um, the, the different um, neighborhood associations that border us are welcome to use that space. So it's just a space for the school to be connected to the community and the community to be connected to the school. And then with that, I pass it on to- We'll turn it over to Sarah. To Sarah, yes, thank yes, you. No problem. Hello, I'm Sarah Tomlin, and I'm the Assistant Executive Director at Forest Home Cemetery. Um, Forest Home Cemetery is an active cemetery, but it's also a historical site. We date back to 1850, um, when Milwaukee was just a few years old, and we were actually outside of the city. Um, we um, have almost ev every uh, beer baron is buried here. Um, and there's large monuments dedicated to them. We have 26 mayors, we have abolitionists, black leaders, 
Um, anyone who was anyone was being buried here at this time around the turn of the century, 19th century. Um, and so right now we are 200 acres still um, in, in the Lincoln Village neighborhood. And we do want people to come in um, and take a look at the grounds, use them to walk on. Um, we have winding hills and um, roads that I think there's about five miles of roads within um, the 200 acres. Um, during times that aren't pandemic times, um, we do have a 5K run that we do. Um, we have a Memorial Day event. We also um, have a Day of the Dead event. And we're looking to add some other things like possibly yoga in the cemetery in the future. Um, but we do encourage people to come and, and, and enjoy the grounds because they're very beautiful. Um, the trees that we have on the property we have about 1,300 trees and about 100 different species. And um, actually, we are working towards becoming an accredited arboretum. And when we do that, we'll have some tree tours and educational possibilities, um, an arbor day um, for people to plant trees. Um, and um, people can run, they can ride bikes, they can do use strollers. Um, and they can even bring their dogs if they're on leash and they, and they pick up after them. Um, but we do encourage people to come and um, take advantage of the, of the cemetery. It was Milwaukee's original park. It was built, um, designed by Increase Lapham, which is uh, a naturalist, uh, Wisconsin's first naturalist. And it was created in the design of the rural garden cemetery movement, which was to make it appear to be a park and really be a place for the living. Um, at the time when it was first built, it was really the only park-like space in Milwaukee. And people would come from downtown to uh, make a day trip to come and visit um, and pay their respects to their relatives, but also to have picnics on the property. So we just want to encourage people who live in the neighborhood to do that same thing. And especially during the pandemic, when they're looking for some place to get out and enjoy um, the, the, um, the, the outdoors. It's a really wonderful place to be. And we also have self-guided tours that people could download from our website at foresthomecemetery.com. And if they come during the day, um, they can come to the office and get a self-guided tour booklet. Um, and the, we, are, we are open, the gates open from seven until five now that it's getting dark. Um, we are an active cemetery. We maybe have about five or so um, burials that happen during the week. Um, and so it's pretty easy to avoid them. Um, and definitely we don't do any on Sunday. So it's a really good time to come visit and not have any um, issues with coming across any families or anything that are grieving. Um, but I encourage everyone to come. And I think the next person who's going to speak is Melissa. Hi. Wow, that was a lot of really interesting stuff that I'm following right now. Very exciting stuff going on in the area. My name is Melissa Seidel. I am with the Milwaukee Health Department. I am working with Amy and Kevin in partnership on this project as the planning department really intentionally brings health into their planning process, which is really exciting. And so I'm here to talk about green space and parks and trails and their connection to health. Um, so access to parks clearly promotes physical activity. Those small parks serve the local neighborhood residents so that they can easily get out and be active. Larger parks often have things like basketball courts, other play fields, um, tracks and everything like that. And those can act as a larger draw, bringing people from further neighborhoods into their area. Walking paths within all these parks can have benches and they can be a really easy, low intensity and accessible option for people to be active by walking. Um, for example, older adults who can't really do vigorous activity, they can still get out and walk and take rest on those benches when they need to. Parents who have strollers can have spots to stop and care for their kids when they need to. So walking paths through those parks can be really great. Um, in addition to walking parks through the Forest Home Cemetery. 
And then parks and green space can be really good for mental health as well. Studies have shown that just being in nature, just being around greenery can improve mental health um, so that Zen Garden on the Zablocki school grounds is a really great idea for that. Having parks nearby can get neighbors out and about. They can see each other, they can meet each other and chat from a safe distance right now. Um, and that can improve that community feel that you're all you know, using your community assets. And then with trails, as we heard from Jessica with county parks, oftentimes they are separated away from traffic. And so trails really help people feel safer using that amenity to get out and be active. Some trails can be purely recreational just to provide that safe active space through nature. Sometimes they can even be an economic boost. They can connect neighborhoods to community assets like business districts or schools, depending on where the trail is located. And so that can sometimes provide a way for people to travel within or between communities in an active way instead of having to use a car all the time. So all these things are really great for both physical health and mental health. And so with that, I will send it back to Amy.